Symbiosis. Can the blockchain help build a more eco-friendly society? Moderated by Fernando Altenez, Brasilia Marketing School. Hello. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Fernando Antunes. I'm a professor and a marketing strategy consultant for tech and crypto companies. I would like to thank Sigma for the invitation and all of you for joining us today. And here we are with uh, Bernie Barrow from Planet Pixel, Fernanda Corsi from Night Plastic, uh, Kir Salome, uh, the CEO of uh, the Center Blockchain of Catalonia, uh, Josh Berger from PKT, and Nico de Jong, it's correct, de Jong? Nico de Jong from uh, Blockchain Valley Virtual. So let's talk uh, about blockchain, society, and sustainability. We live in a society requiring movements to a more innovative and sustainable uh, future. Our society has more significant concerns about our environment and issues arising from climate change and many other mega trends every day. Increasingly, we see that managing these concerns is a challenge for all of us. Today, we will have the opportunity to explore how the development of blockchain technology can align with the vision of a sustainable society and go beyond with the discussion. So, can the blockchain help build a more eco-friendly society? To discuss about this, we are going to talk today with these amazing fellows who I would like to ask them to introduce themselves. So, let's start with Fernanda. Oh, what a pleasure. Thank you, Fernanda. I think you changed my, my name just because of the similarity, no? Thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a marketing and communication director for commercializing products, services, and platforms that actually deliver social and environmental impact. I'm now the head of uh, the marketing department at Plastics, and uh, I would like to ask all of you guys here when you wake up in the morning and you're going to work, have you ever thought that you were not being fairly compensated by what you're doing? It seems like we are very much privileged, no? Uh, I don't see anyone raising their hands and that doesn't happen with me either. Actually, my boss is here, so I should not say anything. But yes, I feel that I am being fairly compensated. And when we talk about um, an eco-friendly society, I prefer to think of a, a fair society to everyone. Uh, I'm going to address something particularly, which is the waste management uh, sector, for example. Uh, I brought this just to show you, this is like a, a piece of tile that was actually produced uh, using polyesterine. And I would like to ask you, like, do you have any idea about how many people how many communities are involved to actually be able to collect all the plastic that was used to be able to produce this piece of tile, for example? Many people are involved. No waste pickers, transformers, recyclers, um, converters. Uh, so all this to tell you that what I believe the blockchain can actually do is bring the possibility of adding all these stakeholders to a fair supply chain and be actually able to compensate and incentivize each one of them for the work that they are doing because the data is going to be down there. We will be discussing this further, but what we're talking about here is blockchain as a technology that is being used, that we can actually produce good solutions and we can work with education, as my fellow said previously, work with the education of people so we can actually input data that is actually trustable data there, right? So I will just leave on so we can keep the conversation open. This was just an introduction. I'm going to be focused a little bit in the waste management sector for this conversation today. Okay, thank you, Fernanda. So, uh, Beryl, please. Hi, guys. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for your attendance. My name is Barney. I'm from Kenya. Um, and out of everything that I've seen here today, the fantastic people and the fantastic projects 
one of the most undervalued assets that I think is still untouched or not looked at is ecological assets. Things, oxygen, food, um, timber, all of these things have actually brought us all here together. They're actually what make us all as part of human. And even if you look at the word as humankind, we're supposed to be kind humans. So how do I address sort of, you know, when you look at sort of the blockchain and the potential of, of understanding sustainability? So with Planet Pixel, what we've managed to do is we've managed to create sort of um, an ecosystem whereby we can understand the economic output or the, the ecological value of forests, uh, trees, areas of high biodiversity. And I think that a lot of us here sometimes misunderstand or misinterpret what biodiversity and ecological value mean. So I look forward to the further conversations and I'd like to pass it to you, sir. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I am Kirza Salomo, the CEO of the Center Blockchain of Catalonia. Uh, the Center Blockchain of Catalonia is a technological center supported and backed by the government of Catalonia and the Chamber of Commerce of Barcelona. Our mission is that our country, Catalonia, adopts the blockchain as soon as possible and ma as massive as possible. We believe that the blockchain is the is the technology that is enabler the digital transformation. Catalonia has been a, a country that has made the takeoff of the industrial revolution very early as, uh, as, as England because we had the, the steam before, every, uh, before everybody. We, we think that the blockchain is the steam for the, this digital transformation and it's because of that that we are facing this, this mission. And in this mission, we, we, our challenge, we, we see that the, uh, uh, we are doing a lot of verticals for, for uh, helping to, to do this mission in the country. And a lot of them are related with the biggest challenge that the humanity has now, that is the climate change. And we, we think that here the blockchain um, is a technology, the best technology, to put the people together, to incentivize the people to do an objective. And I, I, I think in, in, in what we are talking now, that is the best, the, the best thing that can, we can use the blockchain, to put all together to do something. So thank you, Chris. Josh, please. Yeah, my name is Josh Berger, and I'm one of the community members of Packet. Since Packet doesn't have a company, it's owned by the people. And uh, the real use of blockchain and what enables this to be possible, um, we'll back up, Packet allows you to earn money and, uh, from your unused internet and uh, to be able to create a network that is owned by the people and not by Fortune 500 and uh, monopolistic ISPs. And so um, blockchain allows for um, a payment ability uh, where other companies maybe don't see an economic incentive to do so. Um, an example, going out to places that don't have internet and don't have access, uh, there's not really the customer base there for an internet service provider to go capitalize on that market. But if a blockchain is autonomously paying you for participating, then that economics is there and uh, you can be able to focus on the social impact that you desire. So that, I think that is the real power of blockchain, uh, creating efficiency uh, and effectiveness uh, with the technology. Thank you, Josh. Nico? Hi, I'm Nico de Jong. I'm the CEO and founder of Blockchain Valley and Blockchain Valley Virtual that you see here. Um, we want to make a lot of impact uh, on climate change. And I see all wondering if this box here in front of me contains my voice. No, it isn't. So we want to show that with blockchain you can do a lot of impact and especially in the metaverse. So in the metaverse, you know, a lot of uh, kids, Generation Z, TikTok generation is there, and they care a lot about the environment. So it's all about education, yeah? We want to change the climate, we want to uh, plant more trees. So even in, in very hot environments like Dubai and the Middle East, we can plant trees in a box like this, that attracts the water out of the atmosphere, collects it, and then it slowly releases
squeeze the water in the rope. Uh, so the roots go very deep. So after a year, the tree has roots that are deep enough. Uh, so the tree has water uh, itself uh, to carry it. So the real impact is the metaverse. That's a blockchain project where we can do the educations for projects like this. And then we have the actual impact in the real world that we can have blockchain tracking uh, how much water does the tree in those warm environments, uh, how fast is the tree uh, growing, um, what are the best trees for that climate and so on. So blockchain can make a real impact there, not only in, educa in education, but also in tracking the progress of what we are doing. Thank you. So thank you, Nico. So uh, to, to start our discussion, I would like to, to raise a question for uh, uh, when we talk about megatrends uh, like climate change, urbanization, demographic growth, digitalization, for example, uh, uh, we are discussing global challenges that highly depend on local action uh, and the use of new technologies, of course. What can we do uh, with blockchain technology uh, to face these challenges? Can you provide a concrete example related to your experience? So. Who want to take this one? Nico? Yeah, like I said, for me it's uh, um, about education. Yeah, We have to make people aware. We saw the world leaders in Glasgow two, three months ago, and again, nothing real was decided to take action, you know? So it's up to us, but we have to educate the people how we can do that. We see, for example, so many adopted trees uh, initiatives but who is adopting a tree? Nobody, because it's far from their bed. But in the metaverse, for example, you can adopt a tree. It's an NFT, so you have a real ownership. So you can see the impact you're doing as a person because you can plant that tree in the metaverse. But then see, you see what is the community doing because you see all the other trees from the other people. And that makes a real impact in the real world uh, with initiatives like this. So, thank you. And another thing, do you want to say something, John? Yeah, I was just saying there's, there's two real ways that you can inspire people to take action, and that's to get them to really believe in something or to pay them. And blockchain allows for that economic incentive for people to be able to make money while being able to do things that they believe in. Um, and by cutting out all the waste of the middlemen that sit in there and take up all the money so that the real people doing the work never actually see the dollars, um, that's the power that blockchain can, can create. So that's nice. Thank you. Do you think I could add to that? So, yeah, yes, of course. So guys, having grown up in Kenya, I've seen the effects of, of poaching decimate not only our forestry, uh, our animals, uh, our wildlife, and our ecosystems. So particularly when you look at the NFT side of things, you know, NFTs are based off rarity. So the value of the NFT increases over time because of how rare it is. So I'll give you an example. I spent many years living and researching in the Maasai Mara. We've got the big five, elephants, rhinos, cheetah, leopard, and buffalo. As a combined value over one year period, five animals bring in over $500 million of revenue. Right? We've got 3,000 lions left. That's a very rare animal to me. So when you look at the NFT and the value of rarity over time, if you're to take the value of that one lion over that one year period, it's about $3.3 .3 million per lion. However, to the local farmer who kills a lion, who doesn't see the income that's generated from tourism, to him, a lion is, is valueless. It doesn't actually have an associated value. So I actually ask all of you, when you look at NFTs, I've seen pictures of monkeys with glasses and stuff, and they're called rare. We've actually got real animals with real value, right, which are actually living on this earth today, and yet, this is where I think the application of blockchain and NFTs can actually really benefit. Follow Nelly the Elephant, you know, and there's also an educational content side, which uh, I would love to explore more. So, that's nice, thank you. Thank you, so uh, another key element, uh, I think, in the discussion is related to... Hello? We can hear. Thank you. <laughs> so another key element uh, uh, in the discussion is related to the supply chain. Uh, do you guys think, uh, can blockchain technology add value to uh, complex supply chains such as waste management, for example? And what the, 
are the benefits that you see? I think okay. Fernanda can talk about this. Okay, I may jump in here. Um, so some supply chains, such as waste management, as I just mentioned, um, they can be very complex because there are many different agents working part of that supply chain. And not exactly the transparency is not helping us to understand all the, all, all the information that is being shared there and everything that is actually being accomplished. No? So, um, uh, for example, um, we're working at Plastics with a marketplace that is connecting recyclers and waste management companies with um, plastic producers, manufacturers, or consumer brands, for example. And we're creating a compensation module that will be actually able to visualize, see, and identify exactly the actors that are taking action uh, to provide a waste management, uh, more efficient waste management system and compensate each one of these actors because all the information is being recorded, tracked, and is giving more transparency to a, a sector that is pretty much opaque you know, in, this, in this sense. So what, what we have exactly is um, a, more, a more transparent and a, a, a traceability added to the supply chain. And what we're trying to do is actually building the, the education and the trust alongside all this supply chain. You know? um, I come from Brazil from Latin America in general. We have here Barney uh, coming from, from Africa, and we know the reality of many of the countries in, this, in these areas. Uh, that we know that we have in big intermediaries and exactly what the pickers, the work that the pickers are doing and the work that the collectors are doing is not exactly being compensated, properly compensated, uh, uh, if we compare it to the, to the main intermediaries, right? So what we're trying to do with blockchain is actually being able to go back the whole supply chain and compensate each one of them. So if we can incentivize in our, in our um, uh, example, uh, the, the recycling, for example, we can at least encourage all this sector to be improving the numbers, the recycling numbers, the recovery numbers in terms of plastics, at least in this sense. Do you Thank think you. I could add to that, just the uh, last thing? So yes. I loved what you said about sort of incentivizing and, and how to make people sort of further down the chain and income. I think it's very important, you know. So one of the things that we sort of looked at was sort of the geofencing of certain areas, the geofencing of certain farmlands. So for example, if an elephant walked into your farmland, uh, we would pay you the percentage value over time of that elephant of how much time he spent in your farm so $3 million divided by 365 days a year, that farmer would earn more than he would if he shot the elephant. So thus, you're actually turning from conservation being a rich man's game, you're actually turning the value upside down, and you're actually giving him a chance to, to earn by keeping the animal alive, which is in a much better situation than where we are today. So I agree with the incentivization of that. Well, in, in terms Here's of place. supply chain, yes, of of that is a, a, a big challenge. That is the, the transparency. Um, when you are facing the transparency, a lot of industries don't like that because they transfer their, their uh, IP, their knowledge, and they don't like to, tra to transfer that to be so transparent. Then the blockchain now is giving solution to that, and uh, we are trying to, to, to build a standard from the center in Catalonia that helps the industry of beverage and food to be transparent in their footprint, carbon footprint, without explaining what they are doing. And then now, I think that we, that in the last years, uh, the blockchain industry has built a technology that can help the, to do that. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, we, 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 we have to talk about NFTs and tokenization things. Um, so. Uh, we know that non-fungible tokens are often considered modern-day collectibles, uh, but how can the application of NFTs and tokenized currencies can benefit sustainability? Well, I have an answer. We can bring that elephants, those lions, and so in the metaverse, we can add a gamification layer to it, uh, earn with it, and people who spend money on it and we can use it to have real impact. So I would like to invite everybody here on stage
to our booth after this so we can sit together how we can change the world. I would love to. I don't know if it, a lot of you, there's a few years ago, there was a, a lion called Cecil the Lion. In fact, I think that Donald Trump's son shot it. And it generated over 2 billion Twitter impressions. I found that quite amazing. So when you look at sort of uh, ecosystem value, and, and one of the hardest things, I think, for, for me to try and get across is how do, you, how do you value a tree? How do you value an animal? What is the economic output of that animal? And through the NFT application, I think there's, there's uh, if I'm, for example, in the South America and I can't find an elephant, I couldn't follow an elephant, but I want to be part of that ecosystem. I think the whole metaverse NFT application allows me to be part of that ecosystem and allows me to also sort of uh, in incorporate myself and understand it, you know? And I think this is really where you see the value being extracted from it. Uh, may, may I add for that? Ah, yes. sorry. No, no, we are, well, we, I was just gonna say are, that. I, I think Josh can, can talk uh, about NFT, of course. And about mining something, uh, I think you can uh, talk about a little bit about this. Sure, I think tokenization gives incentivization, you know? And so uh, without that, people are just doing things out of the goodness of their hearts. So being able to uh, incentivize entrepreneurs to be able to take action, to be able to have impact, but also to be able to make money out of it. And that is the power of what crypto has created and these different tokens and NFT projects allows people to do things that they believe in because they believe in them, but also to be able to create businesses out of it and inspire entrepreneurs to have impact and also be able to make a living out of it instead of this just being a side hustle. Okay. Safe to earn you, instead of play to earn. Safe to earn. Safe to earn. Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, we are out of time right now, but uh, I would like to, to, to make a, the last question and for a 10, 15 second answer for each one, maybe one word. And... Uh, what do we need to make uh, tokenomics more mainstream and make it help to defend our ecosystems? For me, the mass adoption is, again, the, the TikTok generation, generation Z. You know, in the past, we learned from our parents and grandparents. Now it will be the other way around. The kids, they will learn their parents and grandparents how blockchain and crypto works, and this will help it further. Thank you, Nico. Um, it's really about usability. You know, we're so focused on these protocols and big buzzwords that help us, you know, be the, the cool kid in town. But really, it's about usability and utility. And if you can make things easy for people to use where they're focused on what it does, not how it works, I think we'll be able to get much greater adoption to this technology. Thank you. For me, I would say make it equitable and accessible. Um, providing a real democracy so everyone can actually have access to that. And I think that many solutions here are being built on top of that, at, or at least to guarantee that. I'd like to invite everyone to come to our booth as well at Plastics, and we can give you some I think some of the biggest sort of inhibiting factors is that regulation should be a solution and not a problem. Having come from Africa, regulation is a problem. It inhibits growth and it inhibits ability. So if we can figure out how to manage the regulators to be a solution provider and not an inhibitor, I think we could be on a win-win situation here. Thank you. I think frictionless is, is, is key, uh, but uh, also to be incentivized to use. I think Plastics has a nice project in this, in this way. You incentivize the people to, to do the, the good, and that is, I think, the people, we are uh, lazy, eh? and yeah. then we need to be incentivized. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Kirzi. So, I'm sorry, guys, we are out of time. So, uh, thank you all to join us today and uh, for this amazing discussion. I think we would be happy to respond to any questions to you may have now after the panel. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Just a quick question. Why is ecology given such a short time frame? Indeed. See you in the next. Thank you. For the next one, we'll be more time.